Thank you. Okay, so as Andy said, I'm Emily Lufnan from ClickSuite, and I've been involved in creating interactive media for 22 years, which is quite a long time. And a lot of that has been in the glam sector, which is where I have to say my, my heart is. Um, and part of our everyday work is doing lots of research about other things that are happening around the world, sometimes with envy, sometimes they're things that inspire us or provoke us or get us debating what works or do what doesn't work, and sometimes they're awful examples. Well, um, a year or so ago, when I was before I pitched this presentation, I had discovered this, Hieronymus Bosch Interactive, The Garden of Earthly Delights. Has anybody in the audience ever seen this interactive? Brilliant, quite a few. I'm not going to open it up. There's a link at the end of the slide, slide set so that you can go and enjoy it for yourself. I just recommend you let yourself have a few minutes and indulge. What you're doing inside it is clicking on all the little tags, diving right into some amazing detail in a painting and having someone tell you the stories and the meaning behind that part of the painting. It is so special. It's so special that it's pretty much changed my life. And I'm not exaggerating, let me tell you the story. So this experience inspired a project that we've been working on over the course of this year, and maybe I'll get to show that to you at next year's NDF, but it also inspired the idea that was it possible for us to make something, to let the glam sector make their own versions of this, with their own artworks or objects or collection items, and their own stories that they have? So since August, we've been bustling away as one of the teams in the Mahuki Innovation Hub in Te Papa and uh, creating a uh, software product called Curio that we are very close to finishing, which allows you to do exactly that. You can find out a little bit more about Mahuki and about Curio at the Mahuki stand at the conference. And if anybody has any questions about being part of Mahuki, then come and talk to me. I'd be really happy to share our experience. So that sort of distracted me from my normal year where I would be in my office completely surrounded by these amazing people and we share all of our links. And it meant that a lot of my research happened actually on the road this year, um, or a lot of the inspiration, I should say. I don't know whether it's being influenced by being in Mahuki, where we have two amazing teams that are doing incredible things with um, VR. If you get a chance to meet them at the conference, both Dot Dot and Open Window are well worth connecting with, if that's an area of interest for you. But VR and AR seem to really rise to the surface of consciousness this year if, in my world. And we started the year off by making a little 360 degree video um, of the Gallipoli exhibition that we'd been involved in to show our, an interactive that we'd made in, its, in situ. And so we gave away these um, Google Cardboards at the Museums Australia conference earlier in the year. And the uptake of that video, I have to say, really surprised me. People clearly enjoyed it and went back and used it several times. I love the Google Cardboard ubiquitous addition to the VR um, suite of products. You may or may not have seen the Tilt paintbrush. Has anybody seen that out by Google? Again, I've got a video link to this. So this is where you can use a pen and draw inside your VR world and do, make a painting like a sculptor does. So when you think about... Um, I think I'll play a little piece of that. When you think about uh, museums moving from being storytellers to being co-creators with their audiences, then I think once we get into VR that allows an audience to create and express themselves, we're actually starting to move into something really quite interesting. I'm going to pause that and hope that that gave you the general idea. <clears throat> and I have a link there so you can play, have a look at it for yourself. Um, when we w travelled with Mahuki to do some market validation on the various ideas that we were planning to take to global markets this year, we had the privilege of a meeting with the team at the New York Natural History Museum. And they shared with us their hollow lens experience that they were doing. 
They've just brought 11 people into their team to do prototyping of VR, and they're simply experimenting. They were putting this um, 3D shark out onto the floor that afternoon to test it on people. Personally, I think AR is a little bit more exciting than VR because I like the idea of augmenting your experience with other data, and whereas VR can be a bit more disconnecting, but there's definitely places for both. Um, one of the interesting things for them is that they have five million people going through the museum a year. And um, so they have throughput issues when you start offering audiences things like this. We tried out the uh, Ghostbusters VR in New York. Amazing experience. Uh, if I'm completely honest, I think it could have been better. It's harsh, but I think they could have used the story and the group activity better. But nevertheless, an amazing experience. On a really good day, they get 200 people through that experience. And then you've got quite a high staff numbers to manage that and try and get that throughput happening is actually an, an intense piece of work to launch. You've also got the issue of you're putting on a helmet that's just been on someone else's head. It's a little bit kind of, ooh, it's warm. Uh, um, and then, especially in America, very conscious of health and safety that you're walking around and tripping and bumping and, um, you know, it doesn't come without hazards. So there's a lot to think about with that, which is um, two things I found interesting in response to that. One was, I wish I could say this was by planning, but it was complete, absolute fluke. We literally stumbled across Google's first store opening on its opening day in New York as we were on our way to another meeting. So we went and had a look, as you do, it'd be rude not to. Um, and how they've solved the VR wandering around problem is putting really neat little swivel stools in so that you could turn around during your VR experience but not worry about bumping in to anybody else. The other experience that I thought has really amazed me about this is another way to cope with it, which is to t turn a whole school bus into a VR experience. Again, I've got a um, video link at the end of the presentation that you can have a look at this. But basically what they do is they, um, it's part of the STEM education program, teacher gets the bus load of kids, puts them in the bus, the bus is normal. You look out the windows and you see Washington DC. What they've done is mapped out a 250 square mile area of Washington DC, and they've mapped out a 250 square mile square, square miles of Mars. And what they do is they flick a switch and the windows become screens, and they drive around Washington DC, and as they turn the corners, they're driving along the surface of Mars. And so the kids are looking out the window going, oh wow, what's that crater? Touch the window, up comes some information, that's the such and such crater, here's the story of it. The teacher's wandering up and down the bus, they're having this amazing lesson on the road. You can bet that you've got the full attention of the entire class. And there's no, you know, it really is a group shared experience. So I feel like that's actually adding something really quite interesting to the VR offering. Um, I also had an incredible experience, albeit straight off the plane, never a good idea, um, at Team Lab in uh, San Francisco. And um, one of the things I just loved there was digital just for beauty's sake and this incredible generative wave video that is absolutely huge and lots of other examples of just digital art that was beautiful, didn't have any purpose except to entertain and decorate. Um, but one of the experiences in there that I thoroughly enjoyed was the aquarium. And what you do here is you take a piece of paper and a crayon, real paper, real crayons, and this is my jellyfish that I drew. Um, then you scan your jellyfish, and then you see your jellyfish appearing on the wall animated. That is just the coolest, seriously neatest thing to see. 
and you can see people wandering down the wall, chasing whatever fish they made. Look, look, and they follow it along, and they're videoing it, and really very thrilling. They've done the same in a, another wall, which is um, transport, and the idea, you know, and look, I work in this space, but it still made my head go, oh, that's just so good. My flat drawing of a bus, oh, back a slide. My flat drawing of a bus, became 3D. It's just so clever and so neat. So you've got all these kids, it's like that, you know those um, mats you used to have as a kid with roads and you know, you'd drive your cars along it and um, it felt like that, but it was 3D and digital and seriously, really a lot of fun. The tables that you were creating drawings at were um, quite heavily populated by adults, I have to say. <laughs> Um, another project that I did not see is, but it's just something that really sparked my imagination, was the rain room in Los Angeles. And the way this works is you've got rain coming down and it um, tracks your X, Y, Z axis, so we know how tall you are. It's actually really similar to some technology we're using in the Bugs exhibition at the moment, but I'm not telling you anything about that, because that's top secret. Um, but you walk through the rain room, and as you walk around, you just stay 100% uh, dry. It tracks exactly where you are, how tall you are, arm goes out, nothing gets wet. The whole room is raining except on you. And I understand it feels a little bit like you've got a superpower, you know, back off rain. Um, without a doubt, OMG, this is the best digital thing I have ever, ever, ever experienced, and that is a big call. Um, it's also the longest I've ever interacted with something that I haven't made. <laughs> um, this is Connected Worlds in the Hall of Science in New York. It is huge. You have a, a waterfall running down the back, all digital, and there are six different worlds on different screens around the room. And what you do is you go up to a wall and you hold your hand out and... Um, it's me videoing my own hand, which is a bit weird. Um, you hold your hand out and various seed pods appear and you can select whatever seed you want and then you just let it go and that plants that seed into that one of the six worlds that you're in. Now the seeds change depending on how the water levels are in your world and how the environment is doing in that particular world. So you can see you can plant a particularly amazing trees and then you can manage the water supply in it by using these reflective logs that sit on the floor. And so um, Tui Taho, who's the general manager of Mahuki, you'll hear from her later in the conference, um, is helping out by sending some water down, so off the waterfall, and she's moving the logs and you shift the water around to your worlds. So I've just asked her to send some water over to my desert that I just planted some seeds in. And of course, boys, when they arrive in this space, I saw it myself, have to go in straight away, get the logs, jam the water, make a, make a, make a water dam. Awesome. And what that does is starve the other worlds of water. And so you soon start seeing the effect of it. I think what I loved the most about this is just that it is so whimsical and beautiful and quirky and deep. The longer you spend there, the more you get it. I went up to the, every world has different interactions you can do, and I went up to the rainforest and went, whew, and I cut down some trees, cool, whew, whew, I slashed down the trees, this is really fun, and then oh, I just felt so bad. I'd lost all the trees in the rainforest, every one. It really affected me, and they didn't grow back. So it, it is a, a very um, deep and magical and special experience and something I'm very grateful to have had a, have had a look at. Just lastly, I wanted to leave you with a very simple online experience that is an elegant way of telling stories. And it's from a different sector. Sometimes I think it's good to look outside of our own sector. Um, again, I have a link to this. It is um, from the main quarterly. It's a tourism example. And it's a web page about an historic walking trail. And you can tell, as you read this and look at it, that the people who put this together 
absolutely love this walking trail. The history that's in it, the stories that are in there, the imagery isn't pristine, beautiful, pure tourism images. They're real images. It has an authenticity to it. If you delve into it and see all the text and stuff that's written in there, you know they love this content. And it reminded me of all the fabulous people I know in the glam sector who have awesome stories and awesome things that they can be sharing. And to me, this was an inspiration of a really simple but hugely effective way to do it uh, in an online environment. So thank you. I hope some of those have maybe inspired you as much as I started off my journey with the Hieronymus Bosch painting a year or so ago, which has now set me up to starting up a new company and all kinds of exciting things. Happy to talk and answer questions in the break and um, to share all the links from all the videos that you might want to see. Thank you.